Christian Assembly Foursquare Church in Missoula, 46 years, and uh, he just recently retired, January of 2019, is that right, January, yeah. Um, and so now he is going around and encouraging uh, pastors and churches in the Northwest. And we are blessed to have him here, somebody of his uh, caliber and um, wisdom. I'm very thankful that he has come. And uh, so he is going to come and give you what God has given to him. And so I encourage you, listen and take notes and say, okay, God, what do you want me to get out of this? Okay? Pastor, you want to come up? Oh, we get both of you? All right. Okay. Well, may I pray for you before you guys get started? All right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good to use. Father, I pray that as these two share what you have for us this morning, that you would anoint them with power, that you would speak through them, that, that your Holy Spirit in them would, um, would speak to us, and that we would hear what you want us to say, that we would be willing to, to hear, to trust, and to obey. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hello, and um, I recognize a few faces here, and it's nice to see um, some of you. Paul. But um, I just wanted to say I, how much I enjoyed the worship. Um, oh, no, we're not doing know, that. We can get together and worship the Lord, and it comes from our heart, and you feel His presence. It's just fabulous. And some places, you know, And I just wanted, one of the things that's been on my heart is how we're all walking through this um, pandemic in different ways, but we're all doing it. And it's really sad when you hear about people that are in their homes and they don't have anybody living with them. They're all alone. And um, so we've been trying to reach out more to those people and just give them a call on the phone, you know, and, and encourage them. And, that might just be something you don't do or doing that, but it, it just, as time went on, it became more aware that there are some people that are really, really struggling badly. But then, you know, I, I also know that there's a scripture in John 14, 1, that tells us, let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. And even though things are different right now, we don't need to be afraid, and that might be something that God says through scripture, not to fear, not to be afraid, he'll give us peace, he'll take care of us, he's with us, and so I just pray to you that um, the peace of God that, that he promises also, um, and do not be afraid, he's in that scripture too, so that the peace of God would just overwhelm each and every one of you, and you would sense that peace when you get up in the morning. And when you hear some bad news, and just declare over yourself the promises that are in God's word. What does God say about you? You know, you're the apple of his eye, and and he loves you so much, and he has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. So I just encourage you to um, hang on and, and just know Jesus is walking this um, difficult path with you. God bless you. Well, good morning. Good morning. I think I'm going to need this this turned down. If you if you wouldn't mind, yeah. Everybody, you're good with this volume. Are you good with this volume? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's good to be with uh, Paul and Sharon and, and all of you at Harvest here. We had dinner last night, and uh, this was my first time. Russell uh, now live too with uh, okay good so welcome those of you who are watching online as well as here uh, this is really a, a unique time isn't it uh, uh, we have not gone this way before 
but I would uh, challenge some of you younger ones that uh, this is not the first time we have had struggles in the United States. And uh, I, I came up through, well, years that I really, really remember were my high school years. And uh, uh, just, just to rehearse some history, we were uh, murdering our president, uh, murdering the would-be next president, his brother Robert, uh, we assassinated a civil rights leader, Martin Luther King Jr. We were in the midst of a war no one wanted to be in, Vietnam. We were burning our cities, inner cities. We were rioting and looting. And uh, the drug culture was in full swing, the hippie movement. And oh, I forgot, um, Watergate. And the president had to step down. Uh, there, there is, uh, there's heaving going on uh, in our nation, uh, but it's not the first time, it might not be the last time. Uh, but I know that uh, with the church, the body of Christ, being the body of Christ in the middle of the storm, uh, we, are, we are assured of victory. And uh, so the choosing of songs and the the framework of Jesus walking on the midst of the storm and saying, come, uh, that's an invitation to all of us. And, uh, so I, I, I want to be an encouragement this morning that uh, some of you for the very first time are in the middle of what's going on in our nation. Uh, and still for others, uh, like what I just described was my generation and prior to them was my mom and dad who some of you may uh, know that almost ancient history now, but um, there was a Great Depression. My parents went through two world wars. They were alive during World War I and World War II, the Korean War, uh, the Dust Bowl, a great famine in the United States. Uh, uh, in fact, I think one old time broadcaster uh, wrote a book called uh, the greatest generation. Uh, he was referring to the generation that was before mine. And uh, so America has gone through a lot. And America is going through a lot today. And so prayer is a big deal. And so is our witness. And so I want to talk about uh, some things because uh, our supervisor, Dave Beach, in uh, at uh, our district uh, office uh, has charged me with being encouraging pastors, encouraging churches, uh, and, and reminding us that it's very important for us to stay on mission. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one author, I believe it's Alan Hirsch, uh, he, he wrote a book, and I'm, I'm not mindful of it right now, but I remember his quote. He said that the, the church doesn't need a mission statement. It already has one. And what the mission statement needs is a church to carry it out. Jesus gave a great commission to the people of God. And that commission has not changed one iota, except the church is maybe a little bit lax in living and speaking, communicating that mission to the church, which is go into all the world and be a witness to me, to Christ, uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, be my witnesses. And so the church and its history really begins in the book of Acts. And if you not read it or read it with real discernment, uh, maybe take your time in the next week or so and read a few chapters of Acts. Uh, but I want to I wanna just touch on six themes that are all throughout the book of Acts, and then they also are throughout all the epistles. These, these several things. One is it was a Christ-centered message. They didn't get off into peripheral things. Uh, they weren't Facebookers in those days. They, they weren't uh, tweeting and tweeting 
and snapping and chatting and whatever else is, you know what I'm saying, that they were, that the message was Christ crucified and risen. And it's in that that there's life and power and we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel because in it is the power of God and in it the righteousness of God Amen. is revealed uh, to everyone who believes. Yes. So we don't need to be ashamed of this good news about Jesus Christ. It's the power of God. Yes. It changes lives. And does our na nation need some changing? Well, the only power is available is the power of God. Yeah. Our very first president said, it is impossible to rightly govern without God. And that's exactly what the message was to the garden, in the Garden of Eden, to two uh, of our, <laughs> the very first human beings on this planet. Uh, uh, basically, you, you can't govern without me. That he gave them this rule, this dominion, and, and, and he said, uh, let, let's do this together. Uh, you can do this, this, and this, but not this. Do I need to explain that what not? Okay. And, um, but they got a big idea to do it their way. Their way. Mm -hmm. And God says we can have phenomenal rule and dominion on this earth if we do it with him not aside from him. And of course, our first parents didn't. And uh, the world was plunged into sin and darkness and death. The book of Acts, uh, I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth, but you'll, you'll be able to track with me. Uh, but some of this message this morning really assumes that, uh, that, that we all have a, a, a basic a biblical format, uh, but I think even if you just carefully listen, parse your saying, what's he saying? What's he, what's he doing? I think it will all, it will come clear as we uh, wrap this up. So the book, the book of Acts is a Christ-centered message from start to finish. It is also a message that is informed by the word of God. The book of Habakkuk, the book of Amos, the book of Joel, uh, the book of Psalms uh, is, is, is interlaced throughout the entire book of Acts, which tells me these, these guys weren't just shooting from the hip. <laughs> they had a Christ-centered message, and even that message was informed by the Word, the, the Word of God, where P Peter says, uh, this Jesus whom you cru crucified uh, uh, is is now risen, even as the scripture said, his, his <coughs> body will not corrupt and see corruption. It, it will be raised up. That came from the book of Psalms. So they were always informing themselves through what the word of God said. And the only word of God then was what we call old. We now have a new testament that started when? In the upper room, when Jesus took elements of bread and a cup, and he said, take and eat you all of this, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup. And this would have just blown those who were discerning, and all of them were, to a, to a great degree, when Jesus took the cup, he was essentially saying, this is a cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink this unto remission of sins. And as often as you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. What was he saying? He's now putting into operation a covenant, a brand new one, that was just beginning. And the old one was passing away. And the New Testament 
now is built. I think it's Ephesians chapter one. I wasn't rehearsing to do this, uh, but it says that the, the foundation on which we stand is built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone of this new deal, the kingdom of God. So the the book of Acts. Christ-centered message, informed by the word of God, sustained by prayer. These guys were always praying. In fact, the church was birthed in a prayer meeting. 120 in the upper room, right? They yep. were praying nonstop in one accord until the Holy Spirit, a promise, came and filled them all in the upper room. They were also empowered by the Holy Spirit. Christ-centered message. Uh, informed by the word. Uh, sustained by prayer. And the early believers were committed to the Great Commission. They were going everywhere. Preaching the gospel. And they were bound by a commandment uh, called the love. Not the old commandment. I'm giving you a new commandment, Jesus said. The old one, remember, was passing away. <laughs> Here's the new standard. It's not like Leviticus said, or Exodus, that's in the law, that said, love your neighbor as yourself. That is in the Old Testament. Jesus said, you know, there's too many loopholes in that one. Because <laughs> I've heard people say, well, I don't love myself. Well, so... That's not the commandment. The commandment is to love your neighbor as. The love of yourself is assumed. So Jesus is not, not, not saying commanded to love yourself. He's saying love your neighbor as yourself. That's the old commandment, though. And he's saying, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another as, as I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus love us? All the way, baby, to the to the full measure of devotion, as I think that's Abraham Lincoln said that. Uh, the full measure of devotion. Your life. He gave his life. Love one another as I have loved you. And by this, they will know you're my disciples. And I wanted to hang in this sixth emphasis of the book of Acts uh, which is this being bound by the great commandment to love one another as I have loved you by this shall everyone know that you love me uh, Paul by which we get much of our doctrine in the New Testament was a social maniac. If there was social media in his day, he would have been all over. <laughs> yep. mm -hmm. and not social media as we we know it today, but social media. If it, if, if it was available, you can bet that man would have been on it. He was tirelessly building family, building connection. As a matter of fact, if you read just the last chapter and you just saw that the last chapter of Romans 15. There must be 20 different names listed. He's saying to the Roman people, oh, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so. Oh, yeah, and, and him and her, and oh, yeah, and, and greet him and his mother, and my mother also. I mean, he's just, it wasn't his physical mother. He, he was just saying, he's getting so close to people, he's saying, your mom's my mom. And, and it, he was incredibly infectious that way, of building relationships with people. They're everywhere. Andronicus and, and Timothy and Barnabas and Silas and Titus and uh, uh, we're going to come into a name here in a moment called Anisiphorus. <laughs> I don't even ask me if that's really pronounced. Hey, you thought it was correct, so let's go with that. Okay? Um, but Onesiphorus, all these names that he 
he was in ministry with, he touched and he, he brought with him. Wherever he was going, he was taking groups of people with him to let them see what Jesus was doing in him. And then he left them there to go do something new with a new batch of people and left the old batch there working with the people in that church that was just established. He was an infectious socialite, loved God, loved people, and they loved him. He gave himself to the church. He gave himself to people. I want to read a portion of scripture in Ephesians. At the end of chapter 1, it says this in the New King James. He's far above all principality and power, might and dominion. Every name that's named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet. That's Christ. Jesus Christ. Gave him, Christ, to be the head over all things to the church. What's the church? The church is his body. The fullness of him that fills up everything. The earth is filled with God through the church. If you missed it, let me read from a modern paraphrase written by Eugene Peterson in the message. He says this, he, he, Christ, is in charge of running everything from governments to galaxies. And every name, there's no name, no power exempt from his rule. No name or power exempt from his rule. And then just in case we missed what that might mean. And that's not just for the time being, but forever. He's in charge of everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is the centerpiece. The centerpiece of the head of the church's mission on this earth. The centerpiece. The church is Christ's body. You hear how Peterson wraps this up now. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts and fills all the world with his presence. Amen. Community of believers, the brotherhood was critical to Paul, and I submit to you that even in COVID, the community of believers is critical to them. And more than ever, I believe the church needs to get these two funny words here. We're going to flush it out a bit. The church desperately needs exhorters mm -hmm. and encouragers. Mm -hmm. Exhorters and encouragers. Exhorters. Exhorter is an old English word. We get our word exhort, exhortation from it. But where it had its start was from a little tiny word called hort. We have another English word that has that root in it called horticulture. Okay? Guys that study women, that study vegetation, fruit, veggies, plant life. Life in the vegetation department, right? Horticulture. You put an X in front of it, like Exodus, and it's come out. It's something to lead, to, to come out. So an exhorter is somebody that's calling out vegetation that's in them. It's cheerleading. You got this. It's a coach pulling stuff out of their players, saying, you got it, baby. You got it, bro. Let, let's, let's move on. And they're cheering what they see is in you at the... It's just waiting to get out. That's an exhorter. Pulling that out of you. Exhorter. The church is desperate for cheerleaders. Coaches. Mentors. People say, come on, man. Cheering the, the next generation on, the generation that's behind that, and, and, and saying, there's a better way to do things. 
Coaches help people do that. Exhorters. And then there's this, this beautiful thing called encouragers. I want to read this from 2 Timothy and kind of moving toward the end here. Paul is, is writing to Timothy. It's called a pastoral epistle. So it's not written to a church necessarily. It's written to a pastor of a church. And he says this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 to verse 18. This you know, Timothy, that all those in Asia have turned away from me. Can you imagine how that felt? People leaving you, people abandoning you, people rejecting you, people you thought were with them mm -hmm. were with you, they're not anymore. Mm -hmm. he's, he, he's saying how much of an embellishment this is, or was he speaking literally or euphemistically, you know, generalizing? I don't, I don't know. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. That's where homogenized milk came from. What? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not more homogenized milk. It's another weird Greek name. The Lord grant mercy. So he's coming to a guy that was a true blue encourager. And that's that crazy name I mentioned earlier. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. For he often refreshed me. Just let that word sink on you for a second. You ever just had somebody refresh you? Refresh. You know what it means. Just in English. He often refreshed me. Gosh, do we need that in the church today. Just people will be around us to refresh us. He was not ashamed of my chains. Paul was in prison in Rome when he's writing this. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and he found me. You don't get to Google like you do today or uh, county jail and who, who is in the county jail so you can go visit them. Listen, you didn't know where anybody was. He had to visit all the prisons in Rome to find his, his friend and mentor. And then he found me. The Lord grant him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know how many ways he has ministered to me at Ephesus. When he was at Ephesus, the same man was caring for him. That's a great portion of scripture. God grant mercy to the Onesiphoruses of this world who find people that are down find people that are discouraged, find people that are depressed, find people that are locked up, find people that are just discouraged and immobilized and earned, and you just, you come alongside them and you, you refresh them. You ever heard of a thing called the ITZ, CZ? You know how government gives abbreviations to everything. This, uh, this actually isn't government. It's the Intertropical Convergence Zone. Ever heard of it? <laughs> Intertropical Convergence Zone, ITCZ. It's a name the marine science and oceanographers give for this region of an invisible belt around the Earth. Mm -hmm. We call it the equator. Mm -hmm. And on a little bit north of the equator and a little bit south of the equator, is where storms generate. We call them by all crazy names. Hildegard, George, Henrietta, uh, Katrina. You, you, you get my drift? That's where all these massive tropical storms come. It, it starts 
in this region of the earth, uh, in this belt around the equator, a little bit north, a little bit south. That's where storms develop. When storms are not developed that, it's eerie and calm. And ancient mariners, sailboats, you know, Columbus sailed the ocean, sail, sail right? When they sailed, that's, that was their power to get here. But if they happened to get caught in this ITCZ where there wasn't a storm, of course, sometimes they got caught in the storms and down they went. But when they got caught in this region of the ITCZ, when it was calm, they could stay there days, weeks, months. And it's generally where mutinies on ship took place because they weren't getting anywhere very quickly. And they give a name to that as well. You ready? It's called the doldrums. Mm -hmm. You ever heard that expression? Yep. Man, he's in the doldrums. Where'd it come from? You're not going anywhere. You're stuck. You're blah. You're blue. And this was describing kind of the life that Paul was in. We think sometimes men and women of God, particularly those of biblical character, uh, were these phenomenal people. Would you like to reread the Bible again? <laughs> it reads like a horror story. Some of God's finest. By the way, that's one of the leading reasons why I believe in the Bible cover to cover is because it doesn't keep out dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. It's all there. You name it. Name a character with the possible exception of Joseph. Because I can't find a whole lot of dirt on Joseph mm -hmm. in the Bible except that he was kind of stupid telling his brothers his dream. That got him into a lot of trouble. One day, one day, brothers, you're all going to bow down to me. Dumb? <laughs> Not really, not smart at all. I mean, he could have just waited till the dream came to pass and said, thank you, God. <laughs> right? In? So anyway, maybe just we can credit him with that dirty laundry was foolishness. Mm -hmm. But everyone else, my goodness, their, their track record reads like, but God used every single one of them. <laughs> They had trouble, and Paul, Paul was in deep yogurt here. He was in prison, awaiting death. We know in chapter 4 of the epistle we're just reading from, it's saying, I know I fought the good fight. It's getting close. I'm about to be offered. Uh, I know that there's a crown waiting for me, that the righteous judge will give me on that day. He knew his time had come to make his departure from earth. And he's saying, well, I thank God. In the midst of this, I had a friend, one, <laughs> that encouraged me, loved me, refreshed me. You need those kind of encouragers and those kind of exhorters in this world. In fact, let me read you how the Living Bible says it. So you're in the doldrums. There's no wind. There's no breeze. Your sails are... <laughs> you're just... Your life is going nowhere. And here's how this living Bible puts this. May the Lord bless on this of course and all his family because he visited me and encouraged me often. His visits revived me like a breath of fresh air. Visits. I remember, I oftentimes people's names pop into my mind. And it's it, more times than not. When I call them out of the blue, 
And oftentimes it's people who have left me. They just, for whatever reason, I was an idiot. I, I don't I don't know. But you call them up and you just tell them you love them. I remember calling an older woman who once who I knew in the place in which I was saved in the Marshall Islands in 1970. Gloriously, marvelously saved, led to the Lord by a man of God, led me to Christ. And uh, in Bible studies he did, there was a man and his wife working on the same military installation as I was, as civilians. And they, they came alongside me and they helped me a lot in coming to know the Lord, growing in, in faith. And I knew her husband had passed, and I called her up out of the blue because her name popped into my head. And I looked up her number, found her, and said, is this Betty, blah, blah. And, uh, and she said, yes. And I said, this is Mike McGovern. I don't think you would remember me. She said, Mike, of course I remember you. Quantum in Marshall Island. And she went out and, and I just said, Betty, you, your name came to my memory today. And, what I, part of my practice is if I can't get to them face to face, I call, try to connect. And, and I said, I just, I just want for you to know this, that you and your husband were an incredible instrument in the hand of God in my early days of growing and becoming the man of God I became today. And I just wanted to say thank you. And she was, she just, she was crying on the phone, as was I. And she said, Mike, you have no no idea what that meant to me because just this morning I was thinking about how worthless and empty my life is and what have I ever done for God it just seems so empty and then you called and you just it was just like man my life just whew, you, you breathe fresh air into my sails I'm like, yeah, yeah I am something in God you know kind of a thing and that's so huge for us to do. So this commandment to love, this new commandment to love one another as I have loved you, to be a cheerleader, uh, a, a mentor, a coach, pulling. Uh, I, I love the definition of famous coach, Landry. Dallas Cowboys, Christian man. He, he wrote a book on coaching, and he was asked one time, how would you just define a coach? So keep in mind, football team, right? 11 people. A coach to me is someone who gets 11 men to do something all week long they hate. So they come Sunday, they can do excellent with what they want to do. <laughs> In other words, he was saying, I get them to practice, 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 and they hate it. But I want them to do that so they can really do what they want to do on Sundays when the NFL plays, sort of. <laughs> Are you following? Being an encourager, an exhorter, pulling things out of people you see clearer than they see themselves. That's what an exhorter is. It's almost like they've got special glasses. Of, Can I have your glasses for a second? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Where they, they put on glasses and they can see inside our souls. They see things we say or do and we just think of nothing. Just whatever. But they're saying, oh, this is, this is the calling of God. This is something special. And, and, and exhorters pulling that out of people to help them find their sweet spot in God. Their, their, their service, their ministry, their, their life. And do you know, do you know, do you, do you not see this in you? This is a call of God. You go, whoa. <laughs> and then you encourage. You encourage them. Those that are in the doldrums. And you start blowing wind into their life and brush your teeth though first <laughs> and, and you're just you're, you're trying to be a fresh wind, a breeze to get their sails open again 
and get them moving in the in the path of God again. Sometimes that takes over and over uh, to get that happening. Let me end with this. The last one of the phrases I used about the book of Acts is that the church was sustained by prayer. They were sustained by prayer. Chapter 2, a more detailed definition of how he created first man and woman, right? Male and female, he created them, called them man, and he planted a garden east in Eden. The earth was already created. Now he's planted a garden. And he says, uh, King James, I, said, I think it says, uh, Ten, ten did keep. <laughs> Some translations have the gall to say to tend and farm. Tend and farm. Cultivate and farm. It's almost like, and by the way, I've heard sermons on They were given a shovel and a pickaxe and a, and a hoe. Plant your radishes over there, beets. Everything is already there. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. What was there to find? But that's the classic of it. Now, when they were thrust out of Eden, Remember after sin? Thorns and thistles shall you work with the sweat of your brow. That was then. That was not this point under. So we have to we have to wonder very seriously what's going on in earth. This this idyllic, beautiful, amazing garden. Everything you can eat from everything except this one. Right? <laughs> right over to the thing they couldn't do. They did. But before that, I have to I have to just say this they were not put in this special garden. Eden means delight, by the way. The English meaning of Eden uh, from Hebrew is delight. It's a garden of delight. Everything you need is there. No shovels needed. No hose needed. Who's there? God. God. Why was he have to? Why? Why the command to rule and take dominion? Who else was in the garden? Someone sinister, parading as a serpent. Suggestion. Did God say? He's keeping something from you. He knows the day you eat of it, your whole world is going to open up. Man, you're going to be like God. Question. Question. Who was more like God at that very moment? Who? Who was like God already? Yeah. So here, here's here, here's the horrible 
reality to us looking back on this was the temptation was to do this in order to become something you already have. You already are. You're, you're, not, you're not having to do something to become something God has already given you in Christ. Already. Quit trying to qualify because first, first chapter of Colossians says, who has already qualified us to be heirs and saints of light. We're already qualified. We're not performing to become his sons and daughters. He's made us sons and daughters in Christ. But we still can't rule on earth and have dominion over the same sinister beings of darkness and the vile demons and minions of hell without God. That's why we need this garden still. We need this prayer life where we are with God in the cool of the day and night and because we have the Holy Spirit living in us all day long. But because the volume of the world is blaring in us, and we give more attention to the noise of the world, the voice of God is oftentimes not heard, but is always speaking. So we need to find a way to turn the volume of the world down and turn the volume of God up. And that our days are filled with whether we are taking the first half an hour, hour of the day with him and just sitting in his presence. We don't have to have any great plan. He just says, come. Come, son. Come, daughter. Come the, sit with me a spell. Let me talk to your spirit. God wants to speak to you. Maybe turn on a little worship music or, or sit there and just say a, things, a, a couple things to God about how much you love him and you want to experience him, experience him today and then let God speak to your spirit. I'm hearing more from God's promptings in my life than I am at this stage in my life than I was earlier in my life, and I was hearing him a lot. Read his word. And just let that, just a portion. And then meditate on it. What are you saying to me, God, in this? How does this apply to me now? Especially when you read Jesus just tearing the Pharisees apart. You hypocrites. You scribes, you brood of vipers. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus had no nice words to the religious leaders of his day. And sometimes you and I read over this, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Ooh. <laughs> Back up. There's a little bit of Pharisee and a little bit of scribe and a little bit of Sadducee in all of us, which is why we're sad. See. Sorry. <laughs> this time with God is just phenomenally important. Because in essence, we would never think this as Christian people. We, would, we wouldn't. We're just too smart for that. We would never say, I don't need God in my daily lives. I'll never hear that from a believer. they demonstrate they don't need God in their life because they don't tune in to his channel. They're tuned in to everything else. And we're trying to do we'll do God's stuff in the sheer energy of and we wind up just like the Ephesian church did in the Ephesian wind up like the Ephesian church in Revelation chapter 2. Did you know Jesus wrote seven epistles? Jesus has seven epistles in them? Sure does. 
there in chapter 2, chapter 3 of Revelation to the church at Ephesus, to the church of Laodicea, to the church of Smyrna, to the church of on and on, Philadelphia. He had a message. He had a letter. And he said to the church of Ephesians, you, you Ephesians, you guys are awesome. You, 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 uh, you identify false apostles and you call them out. You're not fooled by anything and you're strong in these works and that old, you, you, you guys just make me proud. But I got this against you. You're doing it all without me. You have forgotten your love. You have forgotten your love. You're doing church stuff. You're, 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 when, when somebody asks you, you're busy, yeah. And, and here's us at, a, at the public dining, dining table. We're almost even ashamed to pray publicly if we do it all. That's not a rebuke. It's just a statement that say sometimes what we say, even the things we're doing, and this is true of pastors as well, not your pastors, of course. But you, you know what I'm saying, in a, in a general kind of a way. It is, it is absolutely possible to put a pastor on cruise control and do all the right things but do it without being hooked up and connected in the garden of delight for God. Mm -hmm. And so church, harvest church. My prayer today for you uh, is that yes, we would be a mission of church that, that we would be a people that keep our message Christ-centered and, and uh, we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit and be powered by the Holy Spirit and uh, be sustained in prayer and uh, committed to the Great Commission and, and uh, bound by this Great Commandment. Uh, that we, we would keep those things central in our life. Um, but in that, those two sustained in prayer and great commandment, that we remember that the commandment of God is about um, looking out for the other guy, the exhorter and the encourager. Look for people. Get out of our self and get into somebody else. Amen. People who might be missing in your life. You haven't seen them in a while. They just disappeared or whatever. Someone you go to school with, or you know in the neighborhood, or you haven't seen them, but knock on their door and uh, say, "Hey, how you doing? I haven't seen you." Whatever, be a, be one that's looking out for the other guy. But as as long as I'm caught up in my own self, self whatever, I I'm, I can't see other person centeredness, not self centeredness, but other person centeredness. Be a coach, be an exhorter, be an encourager, and get into the garden every day with God. Okay. And walk and talk and uh, listen to the Master because He's talking. He is really talking. And He wants to talk. There we go. So, ladies and gentlemen, go with God in God's power and be the exhorter, the encourager that somebody needs in their lives. But remember to go with God in his power, which means that the first thing we need to do is we need to start 
by spending time with him here and then going out in his power. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the, the word that you have given us this morning. Lord, please bring it to our minds this week, every day, every morning, every evening. Remind us how you desire to spend time with us. It's not, it's not just a, a, a religious thing, but it's something, Lord, that in relationship with you, you desire to spend time with us. And then, God, would you please help us to be aware of who we can exhort and encourage this week, whether it's the worker at Walmart because they have to figure out how to get everybody to wear masks this week. Or maybe it's the, the waitress who um, just had a bad week. Or, or maybe it's our coworker who's scared of, of bringing the disease home to her uh, older parents. Lord, whoever it is, help us to be that encourager and exhorter this week. Help us to see what you, where you are at work and to join in. In Jesus' name.